Hey, beautiful friends. Welcome back to another episode of the Robin Graham Show. I have a guest with me today named Karen Laus, just like house. And she is just this shining light. We've been talking in the green room for a little bit here. And oh my gosh, my heart's on fire for her. And I can't wait to have this conversation. So I want to ask you a quick question. Do you have confidence? And what does confidence look like to you? I know for me, I have gone through life with periods where I didn't have a lot of confidence. Then I've had periods where I had more confidence. And I have to say, the deeper my faith is, the more confidence I have. So as I grow as an individual, as I grow as a business owner, as I grow as just a human being, living my life, walking the walk, and leaning more into my faith and the Holy Spirit in me, my confidence gets stronger. So that's what we're going to talk about today. And I want you to think about right now where you are with your confidence level. And then after the show, I would love to hear from you to see if you have a new perspective and if your level of confidence has changed or if you're ready to take action to improve your confidence level. Without further ado, Karen Louts, welcome to The Robin Graham Show. Thank you so much. Can't wait for our conversation. Oh my goodness. I feel like I could talk to you all day long. And you're just, <laughs> like I said in the intro, you're just a light. Like I'm just so excited that you're here and I can't wait to have this conversation because I think so many of us struggle with confidence at one point in time or another. And the reality is we're inundated with all of this visual content and stuff online that really can be intimidating and take that confidence from us because we start to compare ourselves. We have imposter syndrome. We Then that stimulates doubt. And then we get stuck in that cycle of overthinking. And all that does is take away confidence from ourselves in what and our gifts that we've been called to use. So I can't wait to dive into this. I really think it's going to help everyone who listens. But before we dive in, will you tell the listeners how you got to this point in your journey and a little bit about what you're doing now? Sure. Well, when I was six years old, my dad took me to a flea market and he said, he gave me a few dollars and said, go have fun, but never pay full price. So from the moment I was six years old, I had negotiation skills. I've always had this confidence on the outside because he also taught me that the squeaky wheel gets the grease. And if you don't ask, you won't get. So I've had that confidence, which has helped me be successful in my career but I also grew up in a traditional home. And what was modeled to me is that as a woman, you didn't have a voice unless a man told you that you did. So I was trying to navigate this throughout my life, trying to figure out, oh my gosh, how do I do that? And so for me, my struggle throughout my life has been, am I enough? Because my mom was also a perfectionist. My dad was quite critical. So the whole bar was set incredibly high. and. In my work, primarily in HR and in corporate training, and after now 14 years specializing in, well, now it's almost 20 years specializing in executive presence and messaging in the corporate arena, I left my job in 2020 after 14 years, specifically to focus on helping women overcome self-doubt and use my communication strategies for them to take action which will then breed more confidence. So I am officially on a mission called 10 and 10, which is now a social initiative. And it is to eradicate self-doubt in 10 million women in the next 10 years. And we are close to 2 million right now. So it's wow. very exciting to see things moving forward. And I have lots of exercises that I look forward to sharing so that people that are listening can immediately put these strategies into play and you can start feeling more confident today. Mm, I love this so much. And I love that you focus on that aspect of doubt and overcoming that, but I also love how it's about communication. And mm -hmm. I'm going to link listeners to in the show notes in a former episode with Deborah Roberts, where we talked about communication and having difficult conversations, because I think these two are going to go hand in hand. We didn't talk about confidence per se, in that conversation. So I think the two of these conversations will really benefit together collectively. Oh, so good. 
let's let's talk about this. I would love to know, Karen, when I would love to know what you see when you're called in to help someone, whether it's an entrepreneur or coming in for someone who is on the career path in corporate, what what do you see is holding people back? Like where does that doubt come from? And what what do you recognize that's consistent with all of these people who are lacking confidence and have that doubt? Well, first of all, those are two questions. I want to call that out for everybody because where doubt comes from is a massive question, <laughs> which specifically connects with two things. One is how we were brought up personally, because so much of our upbringing is related to where we are today. We carry that with yes. us wherever we go. And then the second component of that is how we have been culturally conditioned in society. So that is a massive part of where doubt comes from. So I'm going to table that if you don't mind nope, and I love extract it. The part related to what I see most of the time. And you touched on it already. And that is with this comparison game and all of that, what and we, we are constantly underestimating ourselves. So that is the lead of my story with this question or the answer to this, because we underestimate ourselves and I see brilliant women coming in underestimating themselves internally and sometimes misrepresenting themselves externally. Mm -hmm. And what I mean by that is some of the most incredible people, most amazing experts are misrepresenting themselves in the way they come across with their voice. For example, they're not projecting, they're not speaking with conviction. And for example, that epidemic called upspeak, which is that slang term for when we end a statement with a question mark, it makes us sound less credible. So just to, to model this really quickly and give a tip to everybody right away, most people, when they introduce themselves, it is a run on sentence. For example, I'll give you two options. One might be, hi, I'm Karen Laus, and I'm originally from Minneapolis, but now I live in San Francisco. That's usually how people talk. Alternatively, which is what's going to help you stand out, and this is where just simply punctuating will make all the difference. Hi, I'm Karen Laus. I am originally from Minneapolis, but now I live in San Francisco. All I did was punctuate and put a period where a period is appropriate. Because if it sounds like I don't know who I am or what I do, then the credibility of how I'm coming across is not going to be seen as if I truly am an expert. And I was thinking about, I recently went to a networking event where I was the speaker and there were 30 women that had 30 seconds each to introduce themselves with their elevator pitch. And I was paying attention because I was going to be talking about the power of our voice. And after everybody finished, I thought this is a perfect example. Not one person put a period after their name or what they do. And that is really important. And most people don't even think about it. So the way that you do this is you record yourself and you listen back. And ideally with a friend or a coach or someone that can give you that outside perspective to go, oh, that was a question mark, not a period. And it is hard for people. Sometimes it takes multiple takes. I've sat with corporate executives that it will take them 15, 20 times to practice this before they can say their name with a period. So that's a big, big thing that I see a lot. And I never want to see a woman misrepresent, misrepresenting herself because everybody is so brilliant, but we second guess ourselves and we doubt. So this is fascinating to me because um, I'm sure I'm guilty of this. But what's, what's interesting <laughs> is, right, of course, but I think when we question, when we have doubt and we question our worth and our value, and we don't have the confidence in what we're bringing to the table, it makes sense that we want to just rush through who we are because we don't believe exactly. that we have the place to really own this space that we're currently in where we're introducing ourselves. Yes, it is. That is a huge part of it. And the other part of it is habit. It's what 95% of all people do. If you start listening to people introducing themselves, you'll hear it all the time. Hi, I, my name is this, and I'm this, and I grew up here, and then I did this, and then I did that. Very few people land until the very end of their introduction. 
Fascinating. Okay. So, okay. So now we know how to introduce ourselves, how to really communicate that we're meant to be at this table where we are today. And I want to emphasize listeners, because if you are wanting to grow your business without social media, which obviously, you know, I'm all about that. PR is such a big opportunity and go, being a guest on podcast. And if you rewind this and go back and listen to Karen and how she talked about herself, you'll see that she probably practiced this exact same principle that she's talking about. But when you are a guest, this is your opportunity to practice this and really show that you're the expert, you're the authority in what you're going to be talking about when you are a guest on a, on any show, or even when you're invited to speak, like, like Karen just mentioned. Absolutely. It is, it is fascinating how this comes up all the time. It's really tough to practice just saying your name with a period because we're so used to saying it along with other things. We don't usually just say, hi, I'm Karen Laus. We usually say, I'm Karen Laus and I'm a keynote speaker and I live here. Maybe we land after that. And it's not the end of the world if you don't say, you know, if it's part of a sentence, that's one thing. It's being intentional though about it. And a lot of times we don't have the awareness. I feel like most of the people that have worked with me came in for a different reason. And then they realized, oh my gosh, I had no idea the things that I was doing that was holding me back. Mm -hmm. And that is one of them is voice. So making sure that you speak with conviction, you also smile while you say it because when I, the other thing I find is that when people start practicing this, they get really serious because they're so focused. <laughs> I'm Karen Louth. <laughs> so remember to keep your voice light as well as projected and have vocal variety. So change up your volume, your pitch and your pace so that you come across with more interest because people are not, we all know what it's like to listen to a monotone voice. So having that change up in your volume, pitch, and pace will make a big difference. And then another huge thing related to credibility is the power of the pause. And very similar to what you said, most of the time when we're nervous, we're rushing through things. And the hard part about that is that how that comes across to the audience is that it can seem like you're nervous. It can also seem like you're out of control. And people don't listen well to people that are speaking that seem out of control. So a simple thing that you can do is to pause occasionally. It doesn't mean that you suddenly become monotone or your pace is exactly the same all the time, but it's making sure that like you can go a little bit faster like there, or now I want to slow down because I really want to make this point. Oh, so you can, that's how you can use your voice to make it more engaging and more interesting. And like you said, with the, those listening that are on PR opportunities, this is a game changer because most people are not trained like this. So when you are standing out with your voice by simply starting with recording yourself, listening to it back, and that is another thing that cracks me up. So many people say, I hate the sound of my voice. I don't want to hear it. And I like to remind people, newsflash, you are the only one in your head. So if you want to hear how everybody else in the world, which is what really matters <laughs> as far as influence goes, how you sound, you've got to get comfortable knowing what your voice really sounds like rather than what's in your head. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. This has been fabulous. So I love this using your voice because- and the other thing is too, you know, you just gave us some really good tactical um, tips about this, but I want to emphasize that our voice, like when people hear us talking, when they can associate our voice with who we are and make that emotional connection, we're more likely to build trust too. So it, I think using our voice and using it in the way that you just suggested is a really powerful combination of the two. Mm -hmm. So yeah. let's talk, Karen, if someone is sitting in a place of doubt, they don't feel confident, maybe they're questioning their worth, like you mentioned earlier, what are some exercises they can do to step away from that doubt and step into really believing in who they are and having the confidence to present themselves as an expert or authority in their niche. Yeah, absolutely. I have three. 
The first one I will mention is the Broadway musical technique. And this is an instantaneous thing. So the first thing you do is you think about what your strongest message of doubt is. So for many women is I'm not good enough. And notice even as I say it, it feels heavy. So identify that first, say it out loud, and then say that exact same phrase, but sing it like a Broadway musical. I'm not good enough. <laughs> and suddenly it's pretty funny. And there's actually neuroscience behind this. So when you say that same phrase, but you sing it, or you say it in a weird voice, or it's just something different, or even saying it laughing, that changes up the neural pathways in our brain so that what that means is it takes the power away from that phrase. And that is one that can be used right away. Doing that in your car, doing that in the bathroom or wherever you feel comfortable. And when you get into the habit of doing that, suddenly it's it doesn't seem as heavy anymore. So that's one. And then the other one is something I call a celebration portfolio. This is making a list of everything that you've accomplished and also collect testimonials from other people. Thinking about the entrepreneurs in the house, I know that there are a list of things that people have said about you, but a lot of times we just think, oh, that's nice. And then we move on. And I'm guilty of this sometimes too. I get some of these beautiful, beautiful messages, but I don't save them all the time. And I'm trying to get better at that. No, I am getting better at that. Not trying. <laughs> I am getting better at that. And that is another thing I'd recommend is collecting those. And in fact, back in 2006, I went to a job interview and I'm convinced this was one of the things, this was the thing that pushed me over the edge to get hired. And at the, cause at the end of the interview, I presented an actual you know, those plastic binders or the th plastic sleeves, mm -hmm. excuse me, those note things. So I had all of these accolades, thank you notes, anything that anybody had ever given me for most of my life and put it into this thing professionally, I should say. And I was still at that time younger in my career, obviously, but it was so fun at the end of the interview. I said, before we go, would you like to see my celebration portfolio? And she said, well, sure. So I hand her this thing that had all now. It's also, I also want to clarify for anybody listening going, oh my gosh, I don't want to do anything that's physical like that. Do it electronically. I'm not suggesting you need to do that. But for me at that time, that is what mostly I would get is physical thank you notes or a typewritten letter or something like that. So that's, that's one that can really help you, especially when you're not having the best day, go back and read some of those and see how amazing you truly are. And then the, the third one is called five and five. And that is to ask five people that you know and trust for five positive qualities or strengths that they see in you. And I find that is such a beautiful exercise because you'll see themes, you'll get a better sense and perspective from other people. So I will stop there. I know that was like a fire hose of exercises. <laughs> No, I, I love it so much. And it's funny that you say that because this really ties into a lot of the mindset talk that we, that we do on the show because, you know, and we have, what I think is so incredible is that God created the brain so miraculously that we can change those neural pathways. We aren't stuck. Yes. We can actually, but you mentioned the word earlier action, and we have to take action in order to be able to do that. So if you're sitting in a place struggling, if you, this is great that Karen's giving us all this information, but don't expect to hear it and have your whole life change and turn upside down and be transformed. You actually have to take the action to do it. But with that action is the power to change those neural pathways. And I, I just wanted to point that out because it is so it's just so incredible to me that if you're sitting in this place of negative thoughts, we know that's going to impact the outcomes that we have, just like feeling unconfident or having a lack of confidence is going to affect the outcomes that we get. And having those testimonies to read, I actually have some taped up on my mic boom. And I, I put sticky notes around because they were so good that it's just a constant reminder of that. Yep. I'm doing what I'm called to do. Yep. I make a difference. Yes, I can have an impact. And when you remind yourself of what other people have said, you can get out of your own head and you can really start to believe that 
no, I actually am pretty darn good at this. <laughs> yes, exactly. Oh, I'm so with you. You know, I was thinking I was at a retreat, which was, this was pretty intense, I will say. But they had us take a moment, about five minutes, and write down all the negative thoughts that we had about ourselves. And then they had us stand up with a partner and we had to pass what we wrote to the partner and they read it to us. It was awful. <laughs> I guess. And the point, although I probably would have done it differently, but the point was you would never have, nobody would ever say those things to you. Yeah. So why would you say them to yourselves? So I guess it made an impact on me since I'm talking about it years later, but it was one of those things where you go, wow, no, I would, what? I would never say that. It was really uncomfortable for those of us that had to read these things to the other person. But it was such a good reminder that, and that's another, I think, an important thing to think about sometimes is, would I say this to someone that in the world, someone that I know and love, let alone, I mean, maybe anybody, probably not even somebody that you didn't like, you yeah. wouldn't say those things to. Yeah, absolutely. And that's part of, in my book, I talk about the five C's of um, navigating anxiety. And those are, you know, catch those thoughts, challenge them. And that's what I say. Would someone you know, love and trust and respect say these things about you, that you're thinking about yourself? And if not, then take the action to change them. And a lot of times I think journaling is such a powerful tool for that, to be able to change those thoughts. So if you're having this doubt, write this doubt down and then write the opposite thought down on the piece of paper next to it. Because if you're thinking you're not worthy of this job or getting this client, or you aren't capable of doing the thing, first of all, ask the Holy Spirit to bless you because he will, and you'll have that extra strength and knowledge. But second of all, write down the opposite thought, because that's going to help change those neural pathways in your brain as you move forward. So I love that. Um, okay, Karen, are there, and, and I know you have an exercise, uh, an ebook actually, or a, a free download on your website, words not to use and instead use these words. Can you yes. just, I don't want to give away like the whole thing, but can you just, because I'd love for people to go and, and download yeah. that for themselves, but will you just give us um, a little insight as to what those words are we should avoid and what we can say instead to, to, to move ourselves forward into a higher place of confidence. The two that are my favorite, because we can use an example in one sentence is eliminating in the right context. And that's also important because there are words in the English language there for a reason, but just and little, for example, if I were to say to you, Robin, I just have a little tip I want to share with you, as opposed to, I have a tip I want to share with you. Getting rid of just and little are modifiers that take away from the strength of our language. And one of the ways you can test yourself on this is in email. A lot of people use just before the word wanted. Things like, I just wanted to update you. I just wanted to check in. Get rid of the just. It doesn't change the meaning. I wanted to check in. It's a much stronger statement. And then the other one, of course, is the common one, but to stop apologizing unless you have wronged someone legitimately. But instead of saying, I'm sorry all the time, train yourself to say, excuse me, instead as your first go-to. You bump into somebody at the grocery store, for example, accidentally. You don't have to say, I'm sorry, but oh, excuse me. But then in thinking about a context where we often apologize on a Zoom call or we're, we're late or we're late to an appointment, running behind, instead of, I'm sorry, saying thank you for your patience or thank you for understanding. Those are some simple reframes to help us because the more that we say I'm sorry as a default, and I know for most of us, it's a habit that we have had over the course of our lives, again, because people around us say it. So we learn from what other people are doing around us. But if we can, the more we say it, the more it almost seems like I'm sorry for taking up space. And that is my big concern for people. When you say I'm sorry so often, it almost feels like, oh, I don't want to bother you. I grew up with a mom who was very involved at our church and every time she would get, she would call people for volunteering. The first words out of her mouth were, I'm sorry to bother you, but I want it, you know, it's like, I just wanted to ask if you'd be willing. And it's amazing. My, when I think about my mom, and again, for anybody listening, when you think about someone that you love 
and you see how they treat themselves or talk about themselves, it's it's really hard sometimes because I think my mom was such an incredible woman to think I'm bothering you. No, you're actually, aren't people yeah. lucky to be talking to you? Yeah, yeah, I love that. I, I've heard that one before and I catch myself sometimes. And it's funny because my kids will say, I'm sorry. And my it's my husband's pet peeve when they say that. But he oh. says it. I'm like, they learned that from you. You say it. <laughs> like, he'll say, I'm sorry, I meant, you know, and I'm like, no, 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 <laughs> don't say sorry. There's no apology needed. It's so funny. This is like a running joke in our house now. Um, but yeah, I love that. So, okay. So for the person who is sitting there thinking, okay, I'm not going to say just or little or I'm sorry. And now they're going to practice the Broadway exercise and do these things. Is there anything else that will really push them forward to believe in themselves and have that confidence they need to stand out as the expert or the, the, the gift that they really are to the world? Mm -hmm. Two things come to mind immediately. And it's similar to what you shared earlier that it has to have action. These things have to have action. So one thing is to literally practice and I mean, practice with a friend, practice on your voice recorder or your video recorder or you know, your phone, whatever you want to do, practice, and then debrief after. Get feedback from a friend or a coach, get feedback. And I know you've got your, well, you just launched your mastermind, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And so you got, a, a, for those listening, you've got a great coach and Robin. I don't know if that's something that you offer, Robin, but- thinking about people in your life that could witness you and give some thoughts around it. That to me is one of the best things that you could do is practice and then get feedback because practice without feedback isn't super helpful because we could continue practicing, but maybe we're not doing it in the most effective way possible. The other thing is the power of affirmations that many of us underestimate. And that is to pick something like you said something earlier about maybe people. And I love this because this is one of the affirmations I love to give people. A lot of people think, well, what they have to say isn't valuable or isn't interesting to others. So an affirmation that you could pick is people love to hear what I have to say. And with affirmations, it's so important to pick a simple one and work on one at a time. That's my recommendation. So you don't have five or 10 that you're trying to say your brain needs time to absorb and through repetition, it will absorb that and eventually start believing it. So say it in the mirror, put it on a post-it, put it on your phone, put it as a screensaver on your phone, whatever it takes for you to see it multiple times and then saying it out loud. And I know a lot of people do this and I do this with certain scripture verses to be able to say that out loud, to really get that life infused in my soul. And so think about also similar to what you said earlier, when you have this negative self-talk, notice what that is and then say the opposite. And then you can turn that into an affirmation that you say regularly. And that's one of the things that I will tell you, I was kind of skeptical about it years and years ago. I mean, I'm, I've always been a personal growth nut to like, give me anything to grow. Yeah. So I've always been a believer on some level, but I didn't really internalize the belief in affirmations until I finally started doing it the way people say to do it. And my affirmation was simply, I am radiant. I said that over a period of two weeks and within that two weeks, I had two random scenarios where people called me radiant. <laughs> it was one was a corporate feedback form and things that that's not a word that most people use on a daily basis, especially in the corporate world. And I will say that is when it really solidified of, oh my gosh, this stuff works. <laughs> you know, I've been doing affirmations and vision boards my whole life. And it's amazing to see those things come to pass. And then when you add your faith into it, which to me would be the foundation, it's incredible when you go, okay, God, this is what I want. And that also makes me think about time that I went up and got prayer at a church. And that was when I was younger in my journey. And there were two gentlemen praying over me and they said, well, what do you want? And I said, well, whatever God wants for me. And they were so gentle and they said, 
But God also wants to know your heart, Karen. And he knows what he wants for you. But there's something about you claiming it and owning it for yourself. And I'll tell you, that was quite a mind shift of, oh, and because I grew up in a household where pretty much my dad chose everything for us and my mom, that I didn't really fully understand the power of self-agency until I was a little bit later in my adult years. Mm, that's beautiful. I love that. And it is so true. Everything I read about prayer says, you know, he wants to hear from us what we want. He wants us to ask him. Yeah. 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 And I think, you know, claiming. yeah, there really is. And and the Holy Spirit, I think, guides us too on what to ask yes. for. Like we're yeah. not in this alone. And right. I know so many, so many people have said, well, I don't know how to pray. Well, you know what? I don't know how to pray either. I just like, talk and, and write and talk and write. And, but when you say, Holy spirit, I don't even know how to pray. He will pray for you. The Bible says yes. that specifically. So I love that, that you tapped into that. Um, okay, Karen, I have one last question for you and we'll wrap up, but how has your faith influenced your journey to become a successful business owner, speaker. I mean, you are a keynote speaker and you speak all the time. You work with huge companies. How has your faith impacted your journey? Well, it's absolutely the foundation for sure. And I think about what comes to mind is the integration of our faith in all areas of our lives, that we can do that. We can have that. <laughs> it is at our disposal. And for me, I, there's a lot of hardship with my husband's health and that has been a long time journey. And so it's, it's very challenging at home a lot of times. And I remember somebody saying, how do you deal with that? And it really struck me a couple of years ago. Of, oh, I just assume like, it's one of those things when something is so part of you, you don't often think about it. And it occurred to me, I started thinking about it because so many people have said, how do you handle that? How do you do it? And it's the simplest thing of, oh, because of my faith. So my faith informs every decision that I make in my personal life and in my business life. And I do believe this is one of the great things that my dad did teach me is the ask part, ask mm -hmm. for what you want. And first, though, we have to figure out what that is. And that's challenging for a lot of us, especially as women. We're so used to giving and serving everybody else that to even take a moment to breathe and take some quiet time to go, wow, what do I really want? And one of the exercises you can do for that is simply to stop, put a timer on so that you're not distracted by other things. Put your hand on your heart. And just to kind of connect physically with yourself and ask God to speak life over you and ask him, like you said, ask the Holy Spirit to guide you. So sometimes that is, well, that isn't just sometimes what I do, but I, I will tell you full disclosure, I have a very hard time sitting still and being quiet with God. <laughs> but I do, I love to pray throughout the day of Lord, help me with this or Holy Spirit, da, 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 and little things like find me a parking place or, you know, whatever it might be <laughs> in San Francisco. That's really a powerful, important prayer, but these little things that we can do that really all add up. And so everybody's got a different style, but to me, the most important thing is trusting in the foundation. Cause when I, when people ask me to define confidence, I've landed for the most part on it's a firm foundational trust in yourself, mm -hmm. but as believers, it is a firm foundational trust in God working within us. But then I've also, I also am a strong believer of recognizing that we need to own the gifts that God has given us because a lot of times we've, we've all probably experienced this, you know, where you, I, I've witnessed this a lot. Like there's some really amazing people on the worship team at my church and years ago, I remember complimenting one of them and she would always do the finger point up to the sky, like, oh, it's all God. And I'm thinking it's almost dismissive of the person that gives you a compliment. So that's, a, that's another thing that I would say is remember to own that and say, thank you. That's so great. Not that you're not giving credit to God, but I do think that sometimes we can be almost so martyr-esque 
that we're not actually owning the gifts that God has given us and that he is happy to have us walk in and accept compliments from people. And that's, that's in general, it's a hard thing to do. It is a hard thing to do, but I think it's important to remember, like he's given you the gifts, but you are the one that has to take action and use the gifts. So you can take that credit humbly, right? We're not supposed right, to be grateful and we are supposed yes. to give him all glory, but yes. we can accept the the appreciation and the gratitude for the fact that we stepped into the gifts he's given right. us. Yeah. Exactly. It's a very, very yeah. important fact. Yeah. Yeah. I think oh, it's a balance. Yeah. Yeah. Karen, this has been a fabulous conversation. I loved every minute of it. And listeners, I really hope that this transformed you. And if you know anyone who's struggling with confidence or, you know, maybe just walking a walk that is challenging right now, I really feel that there are tidbits in this conversation that could help just about anybody out there. And I just said the word just, but... <laughs> It could help everyone out. It there. happens. I believe me. I'm editing myself all the time. And I'm starting to have a little bit of a different viewpoint on it right now, to be honest. But we will we will table that for another conversation. Yeah. <laughs> uh, like everything else in moderation, right? Yes. Um, exactly. all right, listeners. Thank you for being here. I love each and every one of you. Appreciate you for being here. And if you would be so kind to leave a rating and review, you know that's gonna make my heart sing. All right. Thank you so much. And I will see you all. Oh, wait, Karen, first, tell the listeners how they can connect with you and learn more from you. Thank you. So go to my website if you want to grab that freebie download on nine words to avoid and what to say instead. And that is KarenLaus.com. And that is spelled K-A-R-E-N-L-A-O-S.com. I also have a membership where people can join to get coaching and group masterminding and all the things specifically related to confident communication. And that is my expertise is the communication part that then gives you the confidence. And that's where the action really comes in. So thanks for asking, Robin. Yes, absolutely. Sorry, I almost forgot. (laughs) All right, listeners, thank you so much for bearing with me there for a second. Have a wonderful week and I'll see y'all next time.